Please be seated. I want all those that are young at heart, especially the children, to come up at this time. Oh, here you come. Come on, Savannah. Come on, Jace. Come on, Lexi. My cute today. Did you Colin, Colin, Jacob, Scott, oh, Carter. Hey. Great to see all of you. How are y'all yeah. doing okay? Yes? Good. Wonderful. We uh, tell stories every Sunday. Uh, sometimes they're stories that are instructive. Sometimes they're stories that are uplifting. What? Come up here. Sometimes we tell funny stories. That's right. I heard you now, Scott. Funny stories, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. What, Jacob? It's sometimes just plain confusing. Sometimes what? They're what? They're confusing. Confusing stories. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> I'm guilty. Are you, Rick? We tell confusing stories sometimes. We, uh, I tried to tell a story this morning, but I, I think I, I need to tell a little differently this morning. The stories we tell uh, are often about Jesus, right? And Jesus is the story of God's love for us. Did you know that? That's what the stories of Jesus are about. And But sometimes people don't uh, receive that love well. You know that? They don't, they don't because they've got things going the way they want them to go, and the Jesus coming in might... Uh, make them have to give up some of that stuff, right? And in the story we read today, Jesus goes into the temple, like, kind of like the church of the day, and he's in there, and there's some people in there, and they kind of got everything going for themselves. They're leaders, they have people looking up to them for answers, and, and uh, it's kind of like they got all the marbles, right? You want to play marbles? And they say, no, we got the marbles. We're not going to let you play marbles, right? And, uh, and Jesus comes in, and he does uh, these incredible things. And they say, what authority do you do this? And, and he ends up telling this little story about these two sons. And one of them uh, says he'll do what the father has asked him to do, and then he doesn't do it, right? Have you all ever done that? You asked to do something, you said you would do it. At least one honest person, Colin, Jace, yeah, good. Scott, Jacob, yeah. And then there was another kid, and the son, and he said he wasn't going to do it. Did you ever tell your parents that? No, I don't want to do it. You ever do that? And, and when, yes, we all have done that, hadn't we? And, and then he goes out and does it. And he says to the Pharisees, the leaders, the ones with all the marbles, you know, uh, who's the one that did the will of the Father? And he said it's the one that did it, right? The one that did what he was asked to do even though he said at first he wasn't going to do it. And what he's doing is he's trying to tell them that if you want to be a part of this kingdom, you can be, but you're supposed to do the Father's will. And the Father's will says we're to love one another, right? And the gift is this overwhelming joy that lifts us up, right? So I'm going to give you a stamp, and it has a little boy that's lifted up with flowers on it. And uh, it will remind you of being lifted up by Jesus. All right. We're good. Thank you, Carter. <laughs> there you go. Jacob. Jacob, we've lost a few, hadn't we? Some of them didn't want a stamp. Lexi wants a stamp on both arms. There you go, little girl. All right. There you go, Scott. And Savannah. Savannah, it's so good to see you. <clears throat> Father, make us the masters of ourselves that we might become the servants of others. Take our minds and think with them. Take our lips and speak through them. And take our hearts and set them on fire through Christ our Lord. Amen. Uh, this morning, around 3 o'clock, I got up and left Gorham's Bluff. Gorham's Bluff is up northwest of Scottsboro, and beautiful place, and I drove back here so I could be with you today. Because yesterday, around 6 o'clock, I performed the wedding vows for Shelton, Trudy's youngest, and uh, Elizabeth, his beloved. 
And uh, we did it at this beautiful setting, right? Beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, and I explained to the people as I uh, was trying to get them focused, because this is a spiritual ceremony and we're the church, right? We say that even in the marriage vows, it says, uh, who will support these people? Will you support these people in their life in Christ? And you say, yes, we will, or something like that. And, and we're all a part of it, right? We're all marrying these people off. And so I'm trying to get them to f be focused on God and God's part in this whole drama, the drama of love, you know, which is God's, you know, love is of God. Whether we can receive that or not, we don't experience love unless it's of God. But yet there's all sorts of distractions, aren't there? Uh, good distractions like this beautiful setting and all the family. But then there's the messiness of the family. Y'all, Have y'all ever heard that life is messy? Have you ever heard that? And And... I worked with this couple on that. Now, I knew as I was working on it that it was rather precarious since it was my wife's son. And so I would take a deep breath and then I would say, now pay attention to all that stuff. All the good stuff and the bad stuff. Because it can get in the way. It can distract us. Take our focus off of what God wants for us and start focusing inward about what we want for ourselves. Right? Now there's a trade-off. We get something great if we focus on what God wants for us. That's the good news. That's the gospel. Now as I was thinking on my way back what I might talk to you about tonight, I, uh, today, I uh, remembered when I played football in high school. I was a little bitty thing compared to the other people and but I was strong and I was wanting to do this football thing. And I remember the coach would work us hard all day long. And then uh, at the end of practice, when we were pretty tuckered out, he'd say, okay, now we're going to run. And they, I found that later they call these gassers. They didn't call those gassers in my football coach speak. And well, we're just going to run. And he said, I want you to run all the way the length of the field and go out to those bushes and come back again. And then we get back and we think we were done. He said, one more time, one more time. And that, and that one more time would generally be about eight times, right? Some of you played football, you know how that is. And, and, uh, and he would say to us at the end, and I hated those gassers. I hated them. I hated a lot of the exercises. But he said, now, uh, this is going to make you stronger. And you're going to play as a team or you won't play at all. It's about teamwork. It's about being a unit, right? That's what the church is. That's what Jesus is teaching in these stories that we read leading up to the crucifixion. We're reading about Jesus molding these people into a unit, teamwork. Uh, as I thought about what we got going on right now and new sort of all the things, the stories swirling around. I remember that this is stewardship time. It's the time we focus more closely on stewardship. And because if you've not been paying attention uh, over the years, I talk a lot about staying focused, right? And the focus is on God through Jesus. That's our, that's our focus. That's why we're here. If we weren't, we'd be doing something else. That's, it's about Jesus. And it's hard to stay focused. And so when we get to stewardship time, we're trying to get narrow focus. We're trying to think, what is this stewardship thing? It's about our relationship with God. And as I was driving down the mountain this morning, uh, wondering if I'd even make it with a deer might run out in front of me or I'd look, turn right when I should have turned left and end up in the woods somewhere. I thought about all of you and how much I wanted to be with you today. And I thought about uh, stewardship and I thought about what it means. And I thought about my old friend, Bill. Bill has gone on to meet his reward, but sometimes before that happened, Bill lost his way. He got angry about some issue and he left. He went off somewhere else and uh, I missed him. I missed him when he did that. And I, I remember talking to him about all sorts of things. He was my buddy. He, we fished together. We did all sorts of things. And uh, 
he liked to talk about stewardship. And he would often say, stewardship is a faith check, right? And, uh, and I'd listen to him. And he'd say, it's not about how much you give. It's about how much you trust. Do you trust God? I remember my coach used to use that kind of language. He said, this is a gut check, right? Do you trust me? Do you trust me enough that I'm leading you to victory here? That's the kind of the language they would use. It's a gut check because you've got to be there when the game is on the line, right? So that we can depend on you. And you know, the church is like that. We depend on each other. You know, if we, if, if we have some task to do or we all have assignments, if someone doesn't do their assignment, then all of a sudden we have a gap. And that gap sometimes goes unattended and sometimes somebody else has to take up the slack. So stewardship is a faith check. It's about whether we will or won't trust God. The uh, stories that we read today are rich stories. Of one in the gospel, Jesus is in the temple uh, where he had a rightful place to be and he was uh, teaching as he often did. And and the Pharisees, they ran the temple. They were real smart people. They had lots of book learning. And they also had all the power. And uh, they didn't like it that this young upstart was in there trying to stir up trouble and make things rich for them. Uh, they didn't see it that way. They thought that he was stealing their thunder. So they said to him, what authority do you do this by? He, they'd seen miracles. Now, if you saw a miracle... Would you challenge the person that performed it? Would you say to him, you know, you don't have any credentials. You don't have a, a badge or uh, the right degrees. You would just celebrate in it, wouldn't you? I mean, you'd think you would. But somehow some people missed it. And the Pharisees were, in this story, missing it. And they uh, said to Jesus this question. And Jesus says, well, I'll ask you a question. Uh, was John's baptism from heaven or was it from man? They knew if they answered from heaven, then that would be it. Their whole house would fall down, their house of cards. And then if they said of man, then the people would be mad at them because they thought Moses to be a prophet. And so Jesus, so they looked at Jesus and said, no, we don't know. And so Jesus tells this story, this kind of strange story about these two sons. Now, you know, we can look at this, this father as the father, right? And the sons would be us, right? And, and one of the sons is asked to go tend the vineyard. And he said, oh, yeah, I'll go do it. And then he didn't. Right? Have y'all ever done that? Said you're going to do something and just drop the ball? I know I have. And then the other son was asked to do the same thing. And he said, no, I'm not going to do it. I was with my grandchildren, five of them, one baby, and the rest uh, old enough to know how to behave. And I would ask him to do stuff at this wedding gathering. And I knew that if everything was going to flow well, everybody was together in support of this event. But those little ones didn't quite know it. They were a little immature. And sometimes I'd say, you need to go do this. And they'd say, no. And I would wonder, what has Grandpa done wrong here? Is Grandpa not presenting this right? Is, is the message not clear that we're all in this together and we're trying to get to the same point? And... Uh, we do that sometimes, don't we? We say we'll do something and we don't or we refuse to do something. And in this case, the one that refused said, uh, came to his senses. He turned around. He changed his mind, which in Greek is metanoia. means you just literally turn direction like I had to do this morning when I went the wrong direction. And, and uh, Jesus says, who did the will of the Father? He says, that's the one that did. They said, that's the one that did the will of the Father. And then he tells them, he said, you know, the tax collectors and sinners are going to get into the kingdom of heaven before you do because you're only interested in what you want. I had a dog. Go, I, I went out to the country one time. I was going to get back to nature and escape all the old folks, right? I was going to go out and get push all that negative stuff, all the shoulds and the alt-twos away and, and just live free in nature and uh, 
you know, it doesn't work that way. You know that. It, and I didn't learn it right away. It took me a while. I got goats and chickens and bees, and I was going to do it, a big garden. Well, it didn't take me long to realize that the world was right there with me. I just intensified the enormity of it because I was now without the support system all around me because, you know, that's what we need, really. We need a support system. And, but one of my creatures that I had taught me some great lessons about life, uh, a dog named Corky. We had several dogs. We, we got Corky, and then we got these two little puppies that just kind of showed up on our doorstep. And, you know, we were Mr. and Mrs. Nature, and we were going to take care of them all. So we had these three dogs. And Corky, he, was a, he had a will of his own and uh, didn't take to training real well. He's a big black dog, a part Labrador and and uh, one day I came home from a job that I was doing and he had killed the rooster you know and now I depended on that rooster and not only did I depend on that rooster the hens depended on the rooster and Corky didn't kill this rooster for to eat the rooster he just killed it because he didn't like the rooster doing what roosters do right and and so he just killed him did away with him I wasn't real happy about that because I had to replace the rooster. A little while later, the, uh, one day I came home from a job I was doing and the little puppies had disappeared. Now I didn't know where they were. And I asked, nobody seemed to know where they were. And so I started going to the neighbors and that was difficult because most of the neighbors were a quarter mile away or so. And I'd go in and I'd say, have you all seen my little puppies? And they'd, here's a picture of them and uh, they've disappeared. And finally one of them said, well, we did see them. There was a big black dog leading him down the road. And he took him a while, and then all of a sudden he took off and ran way far away from them. And they were lost. They were just sitting there lost because they had been let out, way out here. And then Corky disappeared because he didn't care about the little puppies. He's on his own. He was doing what he wanted to do. And the little puppies were at these people's house, thanks be to God. Well, later on, I had to get rid of Corky because he killed a second rooster. And we just couldn't have that. I tell you this because I learned something from Corky. I learned that we do have responsibilities for each other. And that's what Jesus was talking about. There's two other stories here that we read. One is Moses in the wilderness with these people that Moses had let out of slavery, Right? You ever felt like you were in slavery? Perhaps you had a job that was really difficult and the boss treating you like you belonged to him, you know? Or you maybe had a difficult situation. I know I have. And th these people were in slavery. They were in actual slavery. Now, he let them out of there. Moses let them out. And in this story, once again, they're complaining, quarreling with him because they don't want to be led to the promised land the way God wants to lead them, they want it their way, right? And so when the water comes out of the rock, Moses names this place Masa Meribah to remember that they quarreled with God on that place. God gave them everything they wanted. They gave them everything they needed, but it wasn't enough. There's another story we read, and it's in the letter of Paul to the Philippians. Uh, i commend this to you. You might want to paste this on your wall. Uh, Tom read it earlier. He says, uh, if there's any love, any sharing of the Spirit, any compassion, and you know, that's what we're about, isn't it? Love, sharing of the Spirit, compassion. What if the Spirit enveloped us right now? Would you want that to happen? You would? You really want it to happen? Let's all ask. Let's say, come Holy Spirit. One, two, three. Come Holy, come Holy Spirit. If there is any spirit, any compassion, simply make my joy complete. Be of the same mind. Having the same love. Being in full accord of one mind. Do nothing for selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Don't look for your own interest, but the interests of others. Let this be this, your mind be the same as Christ Jesus, who gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice. Jesus did that for us. You know that, don't you? He did it willingly. He presented himself willingly for us. He knew the consequences. And yet he knew that the gift that we would receive 
through a life led in that spirit was greater than anything we could imagine. That's the good news, really. That's what God promises us. us. That's why I was willing to make those sacrifices to play football because I believed that it was something greater going to happen at the end. Christians, some of us call ourselves Christians, our job is to trust in God. That's what stewardship is really about. It's not about money. It's not about how much you do for the church. It's about trusting in God totally. That's what Christians are called to do. And if we do that, the gift of grace is greater than anything we can ever imagine. And we can have it if we just trust in God and love one another. And that's good news. Those with ears to hear, let them hear.